Now listen, a familiar spirit will find you every time. So just keep a beating on you. Just keep a pounding on you. Woo! Two more times we'll run that one off. Woo-hoo! Your old sister or brother such and such say something next week about the same way. What did I say before? Now, now, now I gave you, the, I gave you the, an illustration before, and now I give you the word. Now let me go back to the illustration. Hey, Kenny, I don't like the way John Brown carpenters. <coughs> now, now, what, now, did you get, now did you get that? I wounded Kenny with that. What did I do? Now listen, a tail bear, the words of a tail bear are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. And when they do that, then they register, register themselves there, and then they will come back up and raise up its ugly head and begin to devour at any given point in time. That's a reason, again, where a lot of these things take place in our lives from the time that we're, we're, we're small. And, they, and they, they come into our lives, and we don't even realize it. We, we, th- we think that being a gossip is part is part of being a Christian. And I'm here to tell you that, that the, being a talebearer, which is a gossip, is not at all what a Christian is to be. In fact, a talebearer is a person living in sin. That's the reason Jesus said that our yeas to be yeas, our nays were to be nay. Not to discuss and have an opinion. And that's, that, that, that's one of the problems that not only here, it's all over the, it's all over the church world. Everybody has an opinion. As to what it is. But I'm here to tell you something. God ain't interested in our opinions. If he was, Jesus wouldn't have said, he'd just turned the the stones to bread. Why? Because that could have been his opinion. But he said, no, no. He said, I'm not going to, I can't do, I can't do anything but that which the Father tells me or shows me. He said, that, that's what I can do. So understand something. If you're in, if you're into this, if you're into gossip, there's some people cannot, just cannot stand not to know what's going on in everybody's life or anybody's life or any situation. They just can't stand it. I mean, they just got to know what's going on. And they just, well, see, it, spiritually, you're done. Did everybody understand that? In the spirit realm, you have committed <laughs> Harry Carey, suicide, whatever. You, you're done. Because why? You have become an abomination to God. You have wounded not only your heart, but now you're wounding somebody else's heart. You're bringing somebody else into a bondage that they may never have thought of to come into. Bless your heart. Until you came along and decided to be the tail bearer. A lot of stripes going to be handed out, folks. See, the problem with the gospel is truth. The problem with you and I, as being carnal as we are, we only want to take the parts of this truth that applies to us and our own spirituality. And it doesn't work that way. You have to take the whole counsel of God's Word. Some of it's bitter, some of it's sweet, some of it's going to be nice, and some of it's going to be downright ugly. But the fact of it is, you're either going to have to take it all and get enough balance in it. See, I keep saying the the problem with us is that we're out of balance and some of us don't have the foggiest idea why, because we're too busy pointing fingers at everybody else. Right? And we don't have the foggiest idea that the bout of being out of balance is, 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 the, is, is that person that, bless God, that doesn't know they're out of balance. Again, if they knew they were out of balance, they'd do something about it. But because they don't, the, the problem, the problem is, is, is really very simple to see when you get into the Word and you begin to examine the Word of God and let the Word of God. See, you've got to let the Word of God get into your heart and, and get honest with your heart and begin to mend that heart. Now, let's go to 17, 22. A merry heart doeth like a, like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Same thing again, isn't it? If your heart is wounded, it's not going to do much. But I'm going to tell you something. If your heart isn't wounded, and it's, it, it, you know, there's joy, it's like a medicine. Why? Because I'm going to tell you something. A wounded heart can kill you. It can absolutely kill you. And it can, some of you know, some of you people here know that you have seen people that, bless God, that have gone to early graves, and, 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 and nobody ever be understanding what is that. Because their hearts are wounded. Bitterness come up within them. I've, I, I have watched in the spirit realm for years and years and years. People uh, 
coming and coming and getting in line and trying to get God to talk into healing them, which you can't talk God into healing you, but actually trying, you know, trying to, to, to get God to move. And I've had people come to me and say, well, I just don't understand. I've been coming up there for healing. I've never been healed. It's my fault. Come on, I don't everybody throw a rock at the same time. Because I got news for you. It couldn't be my fault. Because I've never told you that I'm a healer, for one thing. And for number two, all I do is possess the anointing of God. Did it ever dawn on these same people that say, well, I'm having all this trouble and I just can't, I've been up there and I didn't get healed. Does it ever dawn on them why that they're not receiving the healing of God? Is them? Well, if they did, they'd do something about it, wouldn't they? But see, they don't know that. They don't know that. I'm telling you, a wounded, a wounded heart, bless God, can, can cause all kinds of problems in your life. Let's go back over into the end of the fourth chapter of, of Proverbs. We're going to get out of Proverbs here in a minute, so don't anybody get worry all your pages out here. The 20th verse, which we've gone over many times, Proverbs 4.20 says, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ears thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thy heart. Where are you supposed to keep the word? In your heart. For their life unto those that find them, and health unto what? All their flesh. So see again how important it is if your heart is right or your heart is wrong. See, a lot of people never realize the reason that they can be sick is because their hearts are monkeyed up. They never realize that the attitude of your heart can absolutely mean whether you, how long you're going to live, whether you're going to be happy, whether you're going to be sad, whether you're going to be healthy, whether you're going to be sick. It is all there within your heart. And yet at the same time, we're out here running around trying to convince ourselves that it's because somebody either lost the anointing, that had the anointing, that never had the anointing, and never could pray for people, somebody couldn't get healed, somebody couldn't this, somebody couldn't that. And that's not what the problem is. The problem isn't that at all. The problem is that we must look into our own hearts and we must cry out, God, examine my heart. If there be anything, David cried out, anything in my heart. And that's what we need to do. But very few people ever pray that prayer. You know why? Because most don't want to know what's in their hearts. Most don't want to have to face what's in their hearts. Most have hidden it away, let it calloused over, and let it just keep hurting and let it keep painting. But I'm here to tell you this night can be the night of your deliverance. The 23rd verse says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. What I read earlier on when we started. You have to guard your heart. You're going to have to grow up enough to stop the nonsense that's being placed into your hearts. You just must. Why? Because it's going to bring no good to you. All it can do is bring harm and pain and sickness. And yet at the same time, some of us run to gossip. Some of us run to see what tells that can be bared and have no idea the wound that we're putting in our own heart by doing it. I hope and pray. I prayed and I sought the face of God all the time I was in Barbados over this message. I said, God... You must grab the hearts of the people. And I told you before I left, God told me that, that, that he was going to set, he's going to set the hearts free. And he's going to do that. You don't, you don't need to be ashamed if you've been one that's had a wounded heart. Bless God, we've all had wounded hearts. You know what the difference is? Those of us that can come over that and forgive and forget and go on, and those of us that harbor it and let it just keep hardening until all we got instead of a, a, a heart in there that's pure of the word of God, it's a piece of hard black coal. And we're still singing in the Holy Ghost and dancing up and down the aisles. No love in the church. Oh, I'm the only one that's got it. Hallelujah. And that's what happens to us. We begin to try to convince ourselves that somehow or the other it's everybody's fault besides ourselves. And that together we're the body of Christ. Separated we're not anything. You know that? Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's, now, let's now go to Matthew, the fifth chapter. We're going to the New Testament. 
Let me, let me put some things here, and I won't dwell very long on this, but let me, let me put something here in, in your bucket and let you think about it. I have pondered for years and years Judas, and I am going to bet, not money, just a verbal way of saying, that I believe that probably Judas had a hard heart. You know, it was James and John and Peter where Jesus's seemed to be favorites for one reason or the other. It was always them that seemed to go apart with Christ. And I'm wondering if, in fact, Judas didn't become like many of us become. I wonder if that didn't wound him. And I'm wondering through that wound if, in fact, he didn't let it fester with bitterness to have betrayed the Messiah. Thought in it. Think about it. Think about it. That he became jealous. He became hurt because he couldn't be the favorite one of Jesus. Why couldn't he have been up there on the mount instead of John and James, Peter? Or at least why couldn't he have been with them? Come on. These people were real, just like you and I. They, they weren't a bit different than you and I. Not one bit different than us. Fifth chapter, Matthew, the eighth verse. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know what that word pure means? Undefiled, unwounded, unhurt. Those of us that are pure in heart, they're going to see God. But those that bless God that have let that wound fester and harden, you can't see God. You know why you can't see God? You can't see God for your self-pity. You can't see him. He's there. He hadn't gone anywhere. I've had people say, I just can't seem to, I just can't seem to feel the presence of God. I don't understand those kind of words. But the fact of it is, I guess they wouldn't say it if they didn't mean it, but the presence of God is to be felt. You can feel the presence of God. It's your heart. You've got to learn to open up your heart. But see, before, 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 before you can receive from your Father which is in heaven the gift in which he has for you, he says, leave your gift on the altar and go into those that you have ought against. See, that's Scripture we're talking. We're talking Scripture. One way for a heart to be healed is to get out in the open that it's been wounded. And not many people can do that. Not many people can go to somebody and say, you have really hurt me. What you said about my shoes hurt me deeply. And you're going, oh man, over a pair of shoes. It wouldn't matter if it was a pair of shoes or an umbrella. It doesn't matter. The fact of it is, you have said something to have offended or to have hurt or to have wounded somebody's heart. See, that's the reason that we need to guard the words that we speak. We need, some of us need to think before we put this in gear. Amen? And some of us need to think before we try to let our flesh rise up and be our flesh. We just need to think. We need to think. What am I doing here? Am I, am I putting a snare? Am I bringing somebody in bondage because of what I'm saying? Or am I saying something against somebody that I'm going to injure or harm or hurt their heart? or wound them to the place where they can't receive from God? Do you think that's accountable unto God? Listen to me closely. You bet you it is. You will stand before God with every word that comes out of your mouth and give account. Every one of them. And that's the reason that we're going to have to grow up. That's the reason that we're, we think we're all growing up and folks, we ain't even started to get a good hoof on it yet. Because I'm going to tell you something. Growing up congregations don't act like this. They're different. They, 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 you, you can't offend them because they won't be offended. Now listen to those people that get their... I heard this years ago by an old Pentecostal gal. For those of you that are looking to be hurt and looking for somebody to say something that hurts you, listen to this one real close. If you're in Christ, then you are dead in Him and dead men have no feelings. Years ago, this Pentecostal gal told me that, and I thought, boy, is that right. Dead people have no feelings. Don't be concerned about what people say. People are going to say the wrong things. 
Some people are going to try to say the right things and end up being the wrong things. The fact of it is, and some people sit and listen, and I have counseled for years with people, sat down and talked to them and them leave and think I said something that I didn't even start to say because they have manufactured in their mind what they're waiting on, and somehow or other I said something to Kit, and that's what I said. Walked out of the room and everything else you don't hear that I said, but just one thing that I said. I said, well, I didn't say that. Well, like I said, you just have to understand, everybody has to give account on that day. Everybody does. Sixth chapter of Matthew, verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart is. There will your heart be also. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where's your heart at? Where's your heart at? What's your treasure? Is your treasure strife? Is it envy? Jealousy? Is it to be a talebearer? Where, where's your heart at? Or is your heart turned totally to God? Because if your heart's turned totally to God, you don't even need this message. See, you don't, you don't even need to have to listen to it because you're only doing and speaking. You're only saying the things that Jesus said, only doing the things that Jesus did. Well, God help us. We all need to work on it. Amen? We all do. That's what we're doing. We're trying to reason. We're trying to find out why. What's going on? Why do we have so many broken hearts here? How many, we got, how many wounded hearts do we have? Jesus said, I come that I might bind up the brokenhearted. And some of us thought those are the ones that lost some loved one. Well, it could be, but it's also those that have been wounded. Those have been wounded and pushed to the side and feel, that feel that they've been pushed to the side. There has to be a place. There has to be, there has to be a caring. But you see, prayer is, is the answer, but prayer, in, in the essence of, of what it is, also must be realized to be a beginning of deliverance. That you have to walk in it. You have to start, you have to change the attitude of your heart. You've got to change it to quit looking to, for somebody to stab you and start loving them. And if you'll love them, I'll guarantee you something, things will begin to change. Matthew 12. Matthew 12. 34. Now this is kind of interesting, and we're not going to go through all this. The 34th verse says, O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth evil things. <clears throat> now, you can't be both. And I have always tried to get you to understand this. You either are speaking good things out of your mouth, okay, and being a good man, or woman, or you're speaking evil things out of your mouth against brothers and sisters, and you are an evil man or an evil woman. You can't be both. Don't fool yourself. You cannot be both. You can't be speaking evil out of your mouth and call yourself a Christian. You can't do it. The Bible will not allow that to be so. Now, you can do it, but it's not going to mean that it is so. Because the, you're, you're moving into a realm. And see, again, the problem with the truth, the problem with God's word as truth that it is, coming into our hearts and enlightening us, then we are responsible for that. And sometimes I wonder if I haven't fed too much word to too few of you that are trying to live it, that are making shambles out of your lives because you know not what you do. You don't understand. If you're going to speak good things, you're a good man. Bad things, you're an evil man. You don't understand that. That's the way God sees it. Am I not reading from you to you out of Matthew, the 12th chapter? Is this not Jesus, our Messiah himself, speaking to us? Of course it is. This is his words. This isn't something that I am making up just to get you to agree with me or disagree with me or anything else. I'm trying to get you to open up your eyes and understand that this is God's word. But I say to you, this 36, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof on the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. And if your words aren't yay, yay, and if your words aren't filled with the fruit of the Spirit, I'm going to tell you something, you better get bent over because you're going to get your stripes on that day. 
And they're not going to be funny. Any fear of God will cause you to try to walk right. Try to, try to walk right. 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter. A couple more verses here and it'll be done. 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter. Now, of course, Paul's going through a thing here. And we're not going to get into what he's doing here, uh, per se. But he's trying to talk about stumbling blocks. And, uh, you know, don't uh, <clears throat> become a stumbling block to those that, uh, that don't believe something, such as to eat meat or whatever it was. But the 12th verse says, But when ye sin, so against the brethren... And we wound their weak conscience. You sin against Christ. Do you see the depth of what I'm trying to say to you? Please, somebody, understand what I'm saying. When you wound somebody else's conscience, when you speak that and wound their conscience, their weak conscience, because see, if they were strong, you couldn't wound them. You know why? They'd either grab this, oh, I'm not going to say a thing, you can just talk all you want to talk, but I'm not listening. Or they'd just say, hey, grow up, turn around and walk off. Most of the problem we've got in this room is not enough of us are growing up to turn around and walk off. We want to get, really? I thought so, that's exactly what I thought. And then they get around me, well, I didn't believe a word I heard. What do you think that is? Well, I got news for you, you don't want to bend over where your diapers get all the way showing. Because that's not maturity. That's, that's the farthest thing from maturity. Couldn't be further from maturity. God's plan for you and I is to mature. But we can't mature as long as we're going to live childish ways. These are rudiments, brothers and sisters. These are absolute rudiments of Christianity itself. Of somewhere we have grossly and sadly missed. And I don't know exactly how we did that. But we did. But it's never too late. That's the thing I love about God. It's never too late if you'll let the Word of God penetrate your heart to bring you back out, put you in the right place, and get you going in the right ways with God. Ephesians, the fifth chapter. The 17th verse. Ephesians 5, 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Okay, now here we go. Now, wants us to understand what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That's the Bible. Okay? Now, we, if in fact you're speaking in, in, in this, uh, speaking to yourselves in psalms, the 19th verse, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I'm going to tell you something. You don't have a wounded heart. People with wounded hearts can't do that. Listen, you can't do that. Well, I go around singing all day. No, now wait a minute. I didn't say you couldn't sing. You can't make melody to the God. You can't draw the anointing. Why? Because your heart's wounded. You go through it all. See, we go through a lot of religious rites. And, and we go through these things and we get to thinking that this is a way to make God move. You know, we, we, I, think we, I think we came to a solemn understanding a few weeks ago that what we lack most in this organization right now is called prayer. That people have become so busy about lots of things that they haven't been able to communicate properly with the Lord. And again, when you lose the flow between you and the Lord, I'm going to tell you, you lose a lot of things and your heart never will be mended. But, you know, when you keep praying and your heart's all monkeyed up, <laughs> you're not going to get anywhere in prayer anyway. So in order for your prayer life to come where it comes, you're going to have to get this all straightened up. This right here is going to have to get straightened up with God. Now, as you can see that we're to submit, submit ourselves one to another. One to another. Submit. Not tell bear. Not tear down. Not destroy. Not stab. Not snare. Not bully. Not bring into bondage. But Submit ourselves one to another there's a big difference and we've just misunderstood the scripture we thought it was the other let's go to colossians the third chapter colossians the third chapter the 12th verse put on therefore as the elect of god that's us holy and beloved bowels of mercies this is what we're to have we're to have all kind of mercies and you want if you have all kind of mercies you don't throw rocks you don't even pick rocks up if you have all kind of mercies. 
because you know that you can't wheel the first stone. Without mercies, you can't do anything. I want to preach one of these nights on mercies. If you don't have the mercies of God operating in your life, I'm going to tell you something. You'll butcher everybody you get around that crosses you because you don't understand that he first hung on the tree for us. That's the reason we are what we are. That's the reason we're going to have eternal life with him. But we butcher each other because we don't understand the mercies of God. We don't understand it at all. So he's saying here, he says, he says, uh, put therefore the elect of the holy, the bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. And here 13, forbearing one another. And that word forbearing I've for years just means to put up with. Put up with one another. Put up with one another. And forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is love, which is the bond of perfectness. See, if you're going to put on, on love, you don't have to worry about the rest of it anyway. You're going to be kind. You're going to be humble. You're going to be meek. You're going to be long-suffering. You're going to forbear. Why? Because you're going to understand. See, I'm going to tell you something. You can't understand where other people, sorry about that, other people, <laughs> Other people are coming from if you're not living in the Word in that area yourself. So the only alternative you've got is to get down there in the mud, the blood, and the beer and go to slinging with them. It's the only alternative you've got because you're not living in the Word to the place where you understand what they don't understand. See, a lot of that's got to do with the mercies of God. When you can understand, when somebody comes to you and going to butcher you, and you can stand there and you can listen and, and, and get done and say, well... You're just going to have to do whatever you got to do. I'm going to pray for you, and you can probably bash me upside the head with another rock. But the fact of it is, they wouldn't be there saying that to start out with if they understood the love of God. See, God never, there again, something, something sadly went wrong with this generation of believers. We have had the opportunity to learn maybe too much. Maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's ever learning, never able to come to the, you know, the truth of the matter. Uh, but... Uh, We've had the opportunity. The thing of it is we have, we have butchered each other to such an extent that that's probably the reason people don't think they can find the love of God any longer in any church services. And that, again, that's sad. Because I'll guarantee you the love of God is in me. I'll guarantee you it is. As hard-nosed as I am as a prophet, the love of God is in me and flows out of me to you. I've had some of you come up here and laid hands on you and you butchered me so many times it isn't even funny and I've, I can hear it in the spirit. And yet I've prayed for you and some of you, some of you, hopefully all of you, have been able to receive. I didn't walk up here and say, well, you go down back sit down there until you get all this straightened up. Quit talking about me like that. Huh? Well, if I was where some of you were at, that's what I'd do. I'd say, well, I'm not praying for you. How dare you come up here and get in this line? How dare you come up here? Now, don't everybody just jump with joy because you know that I'm telling you the truth. Some of you talk, out, talk about me like a dog when you're out here uh, with some of the people. Other people talk like me, about me like a dog. Then you're able to come up here and receive from me when I'm laying hands on people. Now there's something wrong somewhere. Come on, don't anybody just fall out of their seat here in the spirit, but it's the truth. There's something wrong with the hearts. It doesn't work that way. That's the reason you're all, you get confused and you, you're all bound up and you, you don't know whether you're being blessed or you're walking in a curse. You, you can't see you, something happens. You, oh, God did this and God did. And then the next day, bless God, you're down the polywogs because something's not going right and everything's not going right. Above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Now, let, now, 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 get a hold of this because this, this, I'm coming right down to the, trying to close this thing up. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. Your flesh man says, hit them in the head with a spiritual hammer. They deserve it. The peace of God in your heart says, no, you're going to love them. Well, I might tomorrow, but I'm going to bless them with a rock today. They got it coming. <laughs> this peace of God in your heart says, no, no, no. You're going to love them. Now, who's winning the battles? Hmm? Who's winning those battles? Folks, these battles are real, and these battles go on, on our, inside of us, all of us, every day of this world. These battles go on. Now, who's winning? Are you letting your flesh, man? But you see something. What, 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 what Paul's trying to get across here is, he says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Pretty tough stuff, isn't it? 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Sound like he had a problem number of the churches with that, didn't it? And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Now listen, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now wait, now listen, get over this. I've decided to bless him. Shut up, spirit. I'm blessing him with a rock in the name of Jesus. That's what you're doing. See, you don't understand. Whatever you do, you're doing in the name of the Lord. If you're lying, you're lying in the name of the Lord. If you're doing stealing, you're stealing in the name of the Lord. If you're, if you're tail-bearing, you're tail-bearing in the name of the Lord. And I'm going to tell you something. God's not in that. But yet because you are a Christian, you are attached. He has become you. You have become him. And you're trying to portray a Christ, a Messiah, that is absolutely contrary to this book called the Bible, the Holy Scriptures. And we can't do that. You, can't, you cannot, just because something doesn't go right, blow a fuse and bless God, decide you're going to blow the world up. In the name of Jesus. You just can't do that. You can't decide to hate your brothers just because something hasn't worked out to suit you or your sisters. You can't do that by the Word of God. Because you're wounding yourself and you're wounding others. And that wounded heart that you're producing, bless God, is never going to have the love of Christ flow through it like it should have and has to have. Until we become so callous that the next thing we know we're on the outside looking in. and We don't know what to do about it. 23, verse 23. And, and, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily, which means willingly, as the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that the Lord, uh, ye shall receive a reward of inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. So say you're going to reap what you sow. That's just another way to say what I could say if I read those stories. Other, other scripture. Now, Luke 10. This is the last that I'm going to give tonight. I have to give. It's hard to sort through the scriptures. There are so many of them. This story in the 10th chapter of Luke, starting in the 30th verse, talks about the Good Samaritan. And I would assume and hopefully rightfully so, that everybody knows the story, that I want to go to the 34th verse. And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him into an inn, and took care of him. And tonight I'm going to pour the oil and the wine into those wounded hearts. And God supernaturally is going to do something in you if, in fact, you can receive what's been said here tonight. If you can receive it. Now, if you can't and, and, and you don't want to receive it, that's fine. But I'm here to tell you that your walk with Jesus Christ will not prevail if you're wounded. It will not prevail. Again, some of you have been wounded from, from your childhood. Some of you have grown up where, bless God, in, in houses and homes where everything goes well, and then when something goes wrong, they turn on each other like vicious dogs. And that's a spirit, and that spirit is not of Christ. Some of you that are here tonight, bless God, that have been hurt deeply by things that people have done. But I'm going to tell you something. The words are we must learn to forgive... And then we're going to have to learn to forget. There is no one that doesn't make mistakes. I'm sorry that I'm not perfect. But when I am, you can clap for joy because I will be in heaven. All right? Until that time, you're going to have to endure. You're going to have to forbear. You're going to have to put up with. But more than that, you're going to have to love me just the way I am. And guess what? 
I have been loving you the way that you have been. And I have been praying for you from the beginning of your existence or coming to know me that God will change you and God will get a hold of you and God will begin to, in your hearts, begin to let you receive the fact. Did it ever dawn on you that you just get tired of all the up and down and round and bowed and shove and push and this and that? Do you ever, don't you ever get tired of it? Don't you ever admit to yourself that the peace of Christ does not prevail inside of you? There's a reason for that. And the reason is right here. When this is monkeyed up, the peace of Christ will be far from you. And that peace of Christ will pass all understanding because it is the love of God. And it will prevail. Because why? Because God wants it to prevail. But it can't prevail as long as that heart is wounded and been calloused over. Trying to, trying to, you know, when you get hurt, you look to be hurt. And after you've been hurt enough, then you just give up. You say, well, that's it. I quit. That's the end of it. The devil's won. You've lost. And you don't even know you lost. You go away feeling bitter, hurt, angry, upset, and everything else that you could muster up feeling. You've got that in your heart. You see, that's not what God wants for your life. That's not, what, that's not what God has to have in your life for you to prevail and to go to the places where you're going. I, I'm going to tell you something. I honestly believe that God's taken, taken I don't, I'm not just talking about this organization. I'm talking about the church. I think God is, is getting ready to take the church to another plateau. And I've, for a long time I felt that. I feel like that God has done, has done a lot of things. I'm going to tell you something. You don't do anything except two things happen to you. Either God puts by His Word and His Spirit in you that guides your footsteps, or you or somebody else puts it in and you guide your own. That's the only two things that happens. That's the only two things that happens to you. What you've got to determine is whether that is God coming in or that is you or somebody else placing it in there that's doing more of the guidance than the Word of God is. And the only way you can do that is to look at your heart and be determ make a determinate fact as to whether your heart is pure before God and undefiled. And if it is, you're in business with God. If it's not and your life is a mess, if you're being sick and things aren't going on, you've got to start wondering about a wounded heart. You've got to start crying out, God, is it because I've had a wounded heart and I can't receive? Because I'm here to tell you again, the Lord Jesus said, that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. And one of the things that he was to do among many was to bind up the brokenhearted. And that's what God's going to do tonight. I want you to stand up. I'm going to pray. And when I get done praying, I'm going to ask you to make a line.